Thank you, Colleen Rowley. And now, uh, who has questions? Yes. Yeah, his, uh, his co-workers attest to the fact that he complained, okay, not only to them but to his superiors. He was told, forget about it, forget about it. Don't you like it here in Hawaii, six million? Come on, Ed, forget about it. Well, he wouldn't forget about it. He's made it very clear that he took that oath to support and, and, and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, very seriously. Is he extraordinary? Unfortunately, he is very unusual. There are only one and maybe a hundred or a thousand that would do that. But you know what? Our government, the NSA and others, cannot do this work without these highly technical people. And if only one in a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand have a conscience and consider oaths sacred, then the governments are in trouble and they know that that's why they're going so fiercely against Ed Snowden. And, and you know, whistleblower protection, there's an ideal about how it should work if you have an inspector general. And since 1989 or so, the laws have embodied this ideal. And then when in practice it doesn't work for different reasons. Um, if you have a wrongdoing that is just one level above you or two, and you know, even serious wrongdoing. I, have a, I had a whistleblower test that it has to be significant you have to be motivated. That's one of the key things. There's a huge difference between a so-called traitor and a whistleblower. The key is motivation. Uh, Robert Hansen and the FBI, the spy, uh, Aldrich James and the CIA, were spies because they were absolutely selling the secrets in order to make themselves rich and to help an enemy country. Very different than when you're Frederick Whitehurst or Colleen Raleigh or, or Daniel Ellsberg or, or Edward Snowden. Very different motivation. I'm, I'm really surprised people have not been able to grasp that. The Espionage Act is not applicable at all. Now, going through the proper channels should be an ideal. Um, unfortunately, since this has all started, some inspector generals who have tried, General Taguba, who tried to investigate the issue of torture, they are only at, a, you know, Taguba was a three-star general. So if people were above him at a higher level where the orders were given, it's really impossible. Uh, professor Vladek, I don't know if some of you know, he's a professor here at uh, George Washington Law School, I believe. And he's an expert on this stuff. And he was in a debate recently and he said, well, Snowden had no option. And he had no option because these orders in this post 9-11 uh, lawless, um, war, law of war type following instead of rule of law. This all began and um, from the highest levels. And when it, it, the orders have come down from the highest levels, it's not going to help you to skip a level and expose wrongdoing. And that's, it's, it, we need to fix this. We need to have independent, like the church committee, that's the only way uh, that we can actually fix when high levels get involved in wrongdoing. We actually absolutely have to have an independent oversight. Well, yes, and, and Edward Snowden, of course, he did complain, um, just as Thomas Drake, I, I should mention Thomas Tam. Thomas Tam was the whistleblower about the warrantless monitoring in the Department of Justice, and he started sounding out people, isn't, oh, I found this secret program where they're monitoring Americans. This was what led to the New York Times 2005 big, you know, bombshell about wa wa monitoring Americans. And he went to his, just as Edward Snowden did, he went to people that he thought would know, and eventually he reached somebody, his supervisor, he reached somebody in Congress, and they say, keep your mouth shut, it's probably unlawful. Now when that's the case, when you know that this is the environment you're in, and you're told, you better keep quiet because it's wrong, and, he, and usually the people that will tell you that will also sympathize and say, we all know it's wrong, but we all better go along with it. I've been, I've seen this over and over and over now. It's not that people don't understand that are given the, these orders and that are part of it, but they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. It, it takes an exceptional Edward Snowden or an exceptional Daniel Ellsberg to realize you're in this kind of a situation where there's very little option for you to act constructively to try to fix the, the real problems in, in a larger sense. And Thomas Drake tried, 
and he got absolutely retaliated against because when you go public, then they have your number. Uh, going back to, somebody asked me about Frederick Whitehurst, the FBI lab whistleblower. He's a perfect example, although it's old example. He tried hard to get the FBI lab fixed so that it was not skewing the results to help prosecutors. And he tried to get it accredited because every lab, every forensic lab in the country was accredited except for the FBI. And the FBI was not accredited because they said, oh, we're, we are beyond that, we're too good, we don't need to be. And he just succeeded after seven years, but they absolutely destroyed Frederick Whitehurst in the meantime. Other questions, yes. I'll do it very short. It is completely incongruent to recognize the merits of a highly illegal, unethical system, which actually has been recognized to some extent. Even the directors have said, we should have shared this with the public, okay? The, the, we should never have kept this secret, and if we had, maybe, maybe people would have understood. That's also not true, too, because total information awareness was shared. Uh, Poindexter went public in about 2004 sharing that this collect it all was going to happen. The Congress was against total information awareness. The people were completely against it even though that was right, that was closer to after 9-11. And so they knew that they couldn't share this with the public and it had to be secret. They've now admitted that the debate is good. It's extremely incongruent to be fixing what you, what's wrong or at least what you're forced to fix publicly and know that this, this doesn't work. We, you know, we're at $17 trillion of debt, and we're going to be spending more money on massive collection. I mean, they, they know, the people in there know it doesn't work. They're fixing it. But it's incongruent to say that the person who made this possible, whose disclosure is now in a public awareness and congressional awareness, uh, is somehow to blame and is, is a problem. That's completely, the, these things, if, you know, again, think it's, it's uh, patriotic. This doesn't make sense at all. Yes, let me direct uh, everybody's attention to the two piles of petitions there. They add up to 100,000 signers. Uh, the one on your right is uh, to Secretary of State Kerry. We're going to be presenting uh, the petition at the State Department building in Foggy Bottom tomorrow morning. And then later in the morning, we're going to be taking the other petition, which is addressed to uh, Attorney General Holder as well as President Obama, over to the Department of Justice building. And then, as I said, at 11 a.m., we'll be doing a briefing on the Constitution Avenue side of the Department of Justice building. So that's 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. In terms of the passport, uh, as you may remember, it was almost exactly nine months ago uh, when um, the last uh, stretch of time, it's a little murky on exactly when the uh, passport was revoked, but late June as uh, uh, Snowden was exiting Hong Kong. And we hear this calumny that somehow uh, he ran to Russia. Uh, but it's a reflection, and actually in the uh, pass out of the top sheet of these petitions that you have, I think one of the uh, many thousands of eloquent signer comments alludes to this. Um, this was uh, the, the last place that, as things worked out, uh, was safe uh, for Edward Snowden to be, and that was Russia. And uh, so the U.S. government was directly complicit and responsible by uh, confiscating and revoking Edward Snowden's passport for having him be stuck in the airport in Moscow and be uh, left with no other option. Now, it is true, to be fair, uh, that uh, Snowden uh, did have another option. He could have come back to the United States and gotten the kind of treatment that Private Manning got, which was, according to one UN report, uh, borderline, if not over the border, of torture, uh, and how much did you hear from uh, Private Manning, uh, now Chelsea Manning, then uh, Bradley Manning, during and after his uh, arrest and throughout his captivity? Uh, this is an effort to silence through revocation of the passport, 
uh, through forcing down an airliner of the uh, head of a sovereign government in Latin America, as you may remember last summer. Uh, uh, the Attorney General of the United States and the President of the United States are clearly today, just as they were nine months ago, hell-bent on flipping over every rock and pulling out all stops to apprehend, if uh, necessary by their lights, apparently even abduct Edward Snowden. And one of these petitions directly addresses uh, that question. So the revocation of the passport and this continuing stance from uh, the Obama White House, uh, particularly ironic now during the news of the last day, um, that uh, approach to Edward Snowden continues unabated and it continues to be reprehensible. Uh, yes. I haven't thought very much about it, Bill, uh, and thanks for raising that. Those are interesting factoids. Now, when I look at the CIA and Obama, uh, I ask myself first and foremost, how could a person who uh, railed against torture and all the other abuses of the Bush administration, how could he let them all walk free? Was he afraid of them? Well, it's been become increasingly clear that, that he was and that he is. Why did he let James Clapper, who lied on the 12th of March last year and said no, the NSA is not collecting any data on Americans? He's still the director of national intelligence. You know, it's really hard for me to believe that, but he is. Michael, uh, the, uh, General Alexander has been allowed to retire. So um, I, the evidence is fairly clear to me that Obama bit off more than he could chew and that if he was going to be this afraid, if he goes, was going to be this afraid of the CIA and the NSA, that he really shouldn't have run for president because it takes guts to stand up to these folks. It's been a long time since presidents have, and what you see now is protect is explicitly what the New York Times has said, a runaway intelligence organization responsive to no one, and that's a clear and present danger here. Uh, we're going to go through some last questions, and then I'll remind you, we, we have the room after the news conference. If you want to do one-on-one -on -one interviews, you're certainly invited. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. McGovern, I got a couple more questions. You're uh, Clifton Cave, Accuracy of Media. I'm sorry? Right, Cliff. Your uh, statements were Obama is scared of these folks. Mm -hmm. I think he's afraid of what might happen. Mm -hmm. Now, in the same room uh, a couple months ago, somebody named Russ Tice, who was introduced as a former NSA analyst mm -hmm. and, and now whistleblower, right. uh, said that uh, in 2004, he had held in his hand NSA documents Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that story? And if that's true, why were they monitoring Obama? What is Obama afraid of coming out? Well, uh, you've heard Ed Snowden say that if he had the president's email address, he could easily hack into it, okay? That's enough for me. He's, he's re reiterated that. And uh, he, we don't need Russ Tice to tell us that uh, the president himself from him on down, they're vulnerable to this bulk collection. And you know why the president doesn't have the guts to stand up and say, no, that's too far. That's, you, you shouldn't lie to, to Congress. And you shouldn't lie uh, in general. And you know, you, uh, Brennan, if you did what, what uh, Dianne Feinstein says, you did, you're out of there. Why, why is he not? Well, I'll tell you a little vignette. Before the last election, the President of the United States was having dinner with a group of progressives, okay, 12, 13 progressives. And they're be beating up on him, saying, you know, you're supposed to be progressive. How can you let all this happen? And you know what he said? 
He ran out of patience. He stood up and he said, don't you remember what happened to Dr. King? I have that on pretty good authority, okay? So, well, I know what happened to JFK. I mean, you just read uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, 